Shukli Amma Ba'ad. As we begin this lecture, we'll start off with a reminder that let us all analyze the quality of our salah. Now, the better the quality of your salah, then it is a sign that you are closer or becoming closer or maintaining closeness with Allah. And this is something that you know, the believer, he, every single day he's thinking about this, he's looking at how good the quality of his salah was, you know, how much was he able to focus in that salah, how much khushur did he have, you know, was he able to connect with Allah and forget everything about this dunya in that salah. And so, again, it's as a reminder that the Muslim, we are always striving to try and perfect our salah, be it physically with the positions, but also in terms of khushur, in terms of understanding. For example, when we take the position of qiyam, there are two ultimate goals when it comes to qiyam. The first of them is complete obedience to Allah. You're standing still. You're not allowed to move unnecessarily. And we find many a times people, they fail in this. And they are breaking their salah without even realizing it. Their salah is becoming batil without them even realizing it. They're constantly moving unnecessarily. Sometimes you're in salah, a person is constantly moving backwards and forwards and all that. Even though you're standing, what are you doing? Now the simple rule is, how do you tell if you're moving too much? You know, also, we are not allowed to smile or laugh or anything as such in salah. If a person is not offering salah and he looks at you and he, it comes across to him that this person is not offering salah, then that's as good as your salah being batil. That's what the ulama said. That if it comes across, if you give the impression that you're not in salah, you're moving around and all this and this and that, then it's as though you're not in salah and your salah is rendered invalid. So one of the goals is... All, ultimate obedience as you stand in front of Allah your arms are folded your head is down humility and the other goal of qiyam is receptiveness of the heart making your heart receptive to the word of Allah it all begins in the salah for you to sit in lectures or anything else and think that your heart can open to the word of Allah but you're not trying to do so in the salah then it becomes very difficult it becomes very difficult for you to do so. May Allah grant us solely good understanding. Which is why for the believer, again, you know, just the surahs that you would recite, be it the small surahs in the back, for you to go over the meaning so that you can contemplate over it whilst you're in salah, it is important because that is how you and I will attain khushur. May Allah grant us all khushur and perfect our salah. Likewise, when we are in rukur, there are two main goals when it comes to rukur. The first is the glorification of Allah and humility. And when you are bowing down and you're saying Subhana Rabbi al azim at that moment we have to realize who exactly al azim is and how magnificent and great he is. And likewise, the second goal is gratitude. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stayed in his ruku' for such a long time, his feet became swollen. And when they asked him, why do you overwork? Why do you exert yourself? His simple response was, should I not be a grateful slave? From this we learn that to show, to express gratitude when you want to stay in ruku' longer and you're saying, Subhana Rabbi al You know, how perfect is my Lord al azim the most great, the most magnificent. And you're thinking about all of the favors of Allah upon you and how huge His favors are upon you. And so out of gratitude, you want to stay in ruku' And when you feel as though you've expressed that thanks, then you come up from ruku' And likewise with sujood, there are two main goals also. The first is complete submissiveness. When you are in sujood, you are accepting that you are at your lowest point. That you are completely powerless before Allah. You are accepting that you have no power whatsoever when it comes to your relationship with Allah. And likewise, wasjud wa qatarib. To get closer to Allah. The essence of closeness to Allah, as Rasulullah says also, that the closest a slave can be to his Lord is when he is in the position of sujood. So again, when we are in sujood also, we want to try and feel a sense of closeness to Allah. May Allah grant us totally good understanding. Mm -hmm. And likewise, each and every single one of us, we need to understand this when it comes to the collective, the jama'ah, when we are offering salah in congregation. And many a time when we go over these reminders, then we start thinking about others. That brother does it. That brother does that. He needs to hear this. And we tend to look 
at ourselves. We start to blame others, forgetting that half the time we are actually guilty of this ourselves. And that is specifically today when it comes to our breath. Especially at four o'clock in the morning, half the time some brothers, they don't brush their teeth before they come to the masjid. They come, they open their mouth, you can smell the morning breath. You wouldn't do that when you go to work. How could we do that when we come to the house of Allah? Likewise, you know, there's people who say, oh, every person is welcome to the masjid. Whereas well, in the general sense, yes, you know, we have, you know, we welcome everybody to the masjid, but also understand what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. For example, if, you, if you've eaten onions, if you've eaten garlic, because the, the smell of it is offensive, you're not welcome to the masjid. Stay, pray at home. So it also comes with a little bit of caution. For a pers- example, if a person is not smelling good, and he, then he comes to the masjid. And this is for our own good, we have to go over this. We come to the masjid, let's say, for example, our breath is not smelling good, or maybe, you know, after a long day at work, you know, we have body odor and all that stuff, we come to the masjid, and then we offend the people next to us, then we're as good as giving them our a'mal, because we are harming them. That is actually wulm. We are taking away from their rights. Because they have a right also to be able to worship Allah in a state of peace, in a state of calmness. So why would a person come to the masjid, not smelling good, troubling the people in the masjid, offending the people in the masjid, and then he expects Allah to accept his salah? It doesn't work like that. Which is why Allah sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and taught us the sunnah. And it is at the height of submissiveness that when we say, okay, I'm going to do everything the way Allah wants me to do, that's submission, that's Islam. That's the meaning and the essence of Islam. May Allah grant us solely good understanding. And the unfortunate part of this and why we are starting off the lecture like this is because we find that it's usually those who are regular to the masjid who do this. I've witnessed it so many times. Like, brother, what's the matter with you? You've been coming to the masjid so long. A person who comes, maybe it's his first time to the masjid after a long time. Maybe he just started practicing. New Muslim, exception. We have to teach them. Like how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually mentioned a person came to the masjid and he urinated. And the Sahaba got angry. But he said, no, teach him. Because that is how we have to be with gentleness. So if you see a person, he's new to the masjid, yes, we're going to teach him the adab. But you're, if you're a brother that comes every single day, you're here every single morning, and you're, you're still not implementing simple manners, Basic manners, this is basic adab of the masjid. But no problem, I'm a good Muslim, Allah will accept my ibadah. We really need to wake ourselves up. May Allah grant us all a good understanding. And so, yes, subhanAllah, it reminds me of a hadith that you know, some people went to Rasulullah wasallam and they asked, what is it that got the people of Jannah into Jannah? And the response of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a very simple response. Not wake up for tahajjud every day, fast every other day, and show you doing this, giving in sadaqah. No. He said two things. Taqwa Allahi wa husnul khuluqi. To have taqwa of Allah, to be mindful of Allah, to be conscious of Allah wherever you may be, and having good character, good manners. These two simple things will get you into jannah. Again, may Allah grant us all jannah to fill those. May Allah grant us all husnul khuluq. We also learn the dua, Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaaha wa zakkiha, anta khayru man zakkaha, anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. And O oh Allah, grant my soul its sense of taqwa and purify it. You are the best to purify it. You are its wali and its mawla. Again, we'll keep that over there. And we'll continue with our lecture and our study on the names of Allah, Al-Malik, Al-Malik, and Al-Malik. And there's many different types of, you, you could say, pairs also we find in the Qur'an. And every pair that Allah pairs in terms of His names, they all play a special importance. Everything plays a specific purpose. You'll find, for example, Al-Malik, the owner or the master. You'll also find Malik Al-Mulk or Malik Al-Mulk, which is the owner of dominion. You'll also find Al-Malik, which means the Sovereign, or Al-Malik Muqtadir, as we find in Surah Qamar, which is the all-powerful king. Or we'll find also Al-Malik Al-Haq, which is the true king, or Maliki Yawm al which is the owner or the master 
of the Day of Judgment. These are all ways we can actually use or call out to Allah in our dua. Maybe when you raise your hands, you can say, Ya Malik, Ya Malik Muqtadir, Ya Malikul Haq. And these are just certain ways. And so to go over, very, very quickly, the recap. The names of Allah, Al-Malik, which means the king, or Al-Malik, which is either the owner or the master, or Al-Malik, which is the sovereign lord. They are all derived from a common word of mulk, milk, or milk. And that is coming from the root of meme, lam kaf. Mulk means kingdom or dominion or mastery over, over something. And so al, al Malik, the king. Usually we find that a king, he is nothing without his subjects. A king needs his support, he needs his ministers, and he needs you know, the income coming in in order to be able to run or govern his country or his land, or his kingdom. And so he needs that support. Whereas for Allah, he is Al-Malik, the perfect king, you could say. He needs neither support. He needs no person to help him. He is completely independent in his kingship. Take, for example, just to bring it closer to understanding, the clouds above us that move. We know that the angels, they move them. Allah, he owns those angels. And Allah is the one who's orchestrating it. And Allah is the one who's giving the angels the power to do it. And he's not relying on anybody else in order for that to happen. Everything that's happening is all by the will of Allah alone. So whilst the angels are moving the clouds, it all still belongs to Allah. And it's all being run on the decree of Allah. And they are simply using what Allah gave them to do what he wants. That's a very important thing to understand. They are using whatever Allah gives them to do what he wants. And it has to be the same for human beings. That whatever Allah gives you, whatever Allah gives me, we have to use it in the way that pleases him, in a way that he wants. And likewise, Al-Malik, which is usually translated as, to as either the master or the owner. Whilst a king can govern something. So a king usually executes his, his command or his decree or his laws in the kingdom. An owner is different. Because you may be an owner of something, that doesn't make you his king. That doesn't mean you can go and execute your own laws. Take, for example, a landlord. You may own a piece of land that makes you a malik of that land. But that doesn't mean that you're the king because then you still have to follow the law of that country. So if you have a king over you, you still have to follow his laws, even though that land then belongs to you. So these are some of the slight differences we find between al-malik and al-malik. And today we'll be going over mainly what the ulama said and the concept of lam ta'arif and the lessons we can attain from that. As for al-malik, the ulama said that this is an intense form of the word Malik. So it is more of an intense form, stressing the kingship of Allah. And we only find it, I think, once in the Quran, where you find in Surah Qamr, where Allah, he says, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَنَهَرٍ That indeed, those who had taqwa, they will be in Jannah with gardens. فِي مَقَعَدِ صِدِقٍ عِنْدَ مَلِيكٍ مُقْتَدِرٍ They will be seated on a seat of honor. And subhanAllah, this ayah is always amazing. Because, you know, we want to be in Jannah, may Allah grant us all Jannah to fill those. You know, to be seated in the presence of Malikim Muqtadir, the all-powerful, almighty king. SubhanAllah, mankind, I wonder what they will give up, what they will sell. They will sell their souls. They will sell their souls just to be able to have a seat of honor of some random king in this life. What will mankind do in order to get that position? Allah is saying, you know, just obey Allah, worship Allah alone. Do what Allah commanded you to do. And then you will have that honor, not with some random king, but with Malik Muqtadir, the almighty, all-powerful king. There is no greater honor for the believer. May Allah grant us all that honor. And so all these three names, as we mentioned, it can be traced back to Al-Malk, which is a reference to something that is being tied or fastened. Or to take possession of something we gave the analogy again to go over it when you put the reins over a horse and then you hold on to those reins then you are the malik of that horse because that horse is completely under your control you direct it everything and so the arabs they usually refer to it as the tying and the fastening of something and so the arabs also refer to somebody who owns something or possesses something as malakahu he owns it and that is why Ibn Kathir, rahimullah, he, his definition of al-Malik or al-Malik is the owner of all things who executes his will over them without any resistance. 
Again, the owner of all things who executes his will on everything without any resistance to his command. Likewise, and again, we're going to get quite technical today because I think we have, this is the third week we are going over this. So we, are, we already have a good understanding of the root word and the linguistic definition. So today we'll get quite technical. So Ash-Shawkani, rahimullah, he said that the scholars, they differed when it came to the two names, Al-Malik and Al-Malik. Some of them said that the name Malik is more intense and general because every king can own something but not every owner can be a king. And because the command of the king is always executed upon the owner. So that's why even some ulama, they said that the name Al-Malik usually is more general and it is more revered than the name Al-Malik, whilst the name Al-Malik is more specific to something. Again, the truth is that every single attribute of Allah, it all has its own unique place. Every single name and attribute of Allah is unique and special in its own way. So we do not make one name greater than another name. Like, you know, that's something we have to be very, very careful of. We do not say one of the names of Allah is insignificant compared to another name of Allah. Rather, all of the names of Allah, and this is part of understanding aqidah, all of the names of Allah are equal. Yes, we do have the greatest name of Allah, Ismul A'lam, which is hidden from us. But that does not mean that the greatest name of Allah is greater than the other attributes of Allah. So we have to also have the correct understanding. Again, may Allah grant us a good understanding. So Al-Malik, the king, is he whose command comes to pass in his kingdom. One may be an owner of something, a Malik of it, but if one's command does not come to pass in it, then he cannot be its Malik or its king. For example, a child. So a child may have some property in their name, but they are not allowed to do with it as they want until they reach a certain age where they are mature enough. So therefore, they cannot do, or they do not have full authority over that property of this. And that's again another difference between Al-Malik and Al-Malik. Another of the definitions given, or what our scholars said, is Al-Malik is regarding the Dhatiyya of Allah, or Sifat Dhatiyya, the essence of Allah. Whilst Al-Malik is regarding the actions of Allah, Sifat Fi'liyya, so when Allah actively takes possession of something, that is regarding Al-Malik, Malik Yawmiddin, for example. Whereas Al-Malik is Allah, he is the king in his essence. So in his essence, Allah is the king. And again, we will go into further detail shortly, but let's further go over what the ulama said. So whilst we do analyze what our scholars said, always remember that every name is unique and we have to use as many names as we can when we make in dua, and especially when we are pondering over the creation of Allah. And so whilst these definitions are on the technical side, again, it is always beneficial to understand these differences so that we may understand the names of Allah better, so that we may be closer to Allah. Likewise, Al-Khattabi, he mentions that Al-Malik, or the king, is in reference to absolute ownership. So again, in the essence of Allah, Allah, he owns all things. Whereas Al-Malik is reference to specific ownership. So when, for, for example, Allah, he says, Malik al-Mulk, he's referring to something specific here, kingdom. Or Malik al-Din, he's referring to something specific over here, which is the day of judgment. And so he's mentioned over here, you know, if there's an owner of a house or an owner of a car, take a mobile phone, he is not referred to as a Malik, as a king, but a Malik in these specific things, an owner in these specific things. However, a person who has a vast variety of possessions, and he has full authority over them at the same time, he can be described as Malik or the king. And thus Allah is Al-Malik and Al-Malik, meaning he is the owner of both what is specific and the owner of that which is vast. And one side note also to mention is that in the Quran we'll find the words mulk and also malakut. Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk. For example, Allah, he says, you know, blessed is he in whose hands belongs the kingdom. And in some places he'll say malakut. Malakut. And the word Malakut is the intense form of Mulk also. So sometimes when we think of Mulk, of kingdom, we think of land. But this is not applicable to Allah. Because Allah, you know, Malakut is the intense form, meaning every single type of kingdom you could ever imagine. Be it the unseen, the unseen realm, or the realm of the heavens, or, you know, the Akhirah. Every single imaginable or unimaginable 
kingdom you could ever imagine or the spiritual kingdom. Allah is the king of all of it. He owns all of it. That is something for us to you know, mention over there. And so very, very quickly to summarize what the ulama said. Number one is not every king is an owner and not every owner is a king. Number two, for example, a person may own land but still has to follow the king. Whereas the king may not own a specific piece of land but his command is executed on it. Allah is both Al-Malik and Al-Malik. He is the king and he is the owner. And number four, the Fuqaha mentions that Al-Malik is general, Al-Malik is specific, and also Al-Malik is regarding the that of Allah, the essence of Allah, and Al-Malik is regarding the actions, the fi'liyyah of Allah. By the way, all of them are correct. And so to go into the specifics and the sort of lessons we can extract from this, again, let's go over the Lam Ta'arif. So the Lam Ta'arif in the names of Allah refers to the Al or the Ar or the Ash at the beginning of the names. For example, Ar-Rahman. The Ar, that's called Lam Ta'arif. And the Lam Ta'arif in the names of Allah, they carry the properties of completion. Again, try to understand. So they carry the properties of perfection or completion. As Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, he mentioned, when something is Kamal, Kamal meaning amazing. So in an attribute that is at the height of perfection, and at the same time, baqa. Baqa meaning everlasting. It does not cease to exist. It is permanent. When you add them both together, that is the properties of perfection. And that is regarding the lam ta'arif. So you'll find that the lam ta'arif in every single name of Allah, it implies perfection and everlasting. Or in simple words, as we've been over in our study of as samad it refers to samadiyya. Because samadiyya is basically something that is amazing and everlasting put together. Again, I hope that makes a, you know, it's a simple explanation of what it is. May Allah grant us only good understanding. And so this refers to Allah's qualities and attributes as being upon the highest level of perfection. And they are all permanent, everlasting, and it never reduces, it never ceases to exist. So if we consider the Lam Ta'arif in the names Al-Malik, Al-Malik and Al-Malik, we could say the perfect king, the one whose kingdom never diminishes. And how many kingdoms have, have come to pass in this life? How many empires have risen and then they've fallen? How many nations came and they were destroyed? And how many nations came and then they were ended? Generation after generation they came, but the kingdom of Al-Malik never ceased to exist. Ever since Allah created His creation, His kingdom has been running. Perfectly, smoothly, His command is executed over it without any resistance. Nothing is able to resist the command of Allah. Everything works flawlessly. If you take the orbits of the planets, if you take the functionality of you know, the cycles of life, the time, the night and the day, it doesn't stop. Because the execution of the will of the king is always done. And he's always looking after his creation. Because the kingship of Allah is perfect. And that's one of the understandings we have of the Lam Ta'arif in the name Al-Malik, the perfect king, is that his kingship is so mighty and so perfect that it never ever diminishes. And likewise also his ownership over all things. So we mentioned how a king cannot be a king unless they have their support. As for Allah, he is Al-Malik, the, the king or the perfect king, because he has some idea in that. Meaning that his kingship, he needs no support and it is everlasting. And likewise also, a few things to understand is we have something when it comes to the names Al-Malik and Al-Malik as primary and secondary ownership. And so we also want to understand, you know, how this name, it affects character traits and how to understand this name as it affects us in terms of mastery and how this name affects other names of Allah. And that's all included in the study of Lam Ta'arif. And so when it comes to primary and secondary ownership, and this is where sometimes we may get confused. So the true owner of all things is Allah. Al-Malikul Haqq, the true king. And he does not share this ownership with any being. He does not share his dominion with any being whatsoever. However, there is also secondary ownership. When he gives to mankind or his creation something, it becomes theirs. So they can take ownership of it. They can call it their own. But the true ownership of it always belongs to Allah. Take for example your bodies. This body is ours. You know, we use the body. We usually say this is my body. 
But the believer knows that the bo our body actually belongs to Allah. He is the primary owner of everything you have and you are the secondary owner of that which you have. Take for example your eyes. Take for example your ears. The believer knows Allah owns all of this. Whilst, you know, the rest of the people, they don't say that. Yes, you know, I own my own body. I've got my own ears, my own eyes. You can't tell me what to do with it. The believer understands. No, Al-Malik is the one who owns me. Al-Malik is the one who owns me. And so I have to do what he wants with it. Likewise, with everything that you see around you, Allah may give you material items. You have your cars. You have your houses. You may own a piece of land. Allah is the primary owner and he gave you some secondary ownership over it. Likewise with Sulaiman for example, and Yusuf for example, when he gave them authority. When Sulaiman made the dua, Rabbi khfirli wa habili mulka la yanbaghi li ahadim min ba'di. Oh Allah grant me such kingdom that none after me will have. And so Allah granted him such a kingdom. But the primary owner of that kingdom of Sulaiman was Allah's. It belongs to Allah. Allah gave him control over the wind, but Allah is the owner of that wind. And so that's something for us to ponder over and to understand. So you're, you own your cars, your homes, you know, everything that you see around you, but know one of the names of Allah is Al-Warith. Al-Warith means the inheritor. This means that everything that you have, Allah gave it to you, but he will inherit it from you, meaning it will all go back to him. And when Allah gives you something, when the king gives you something, he gives it to you with purpose. You are never ever given anything in this life except that it is with purpose. And think for a moment, if Allah had to give you something, just for you to have your own ownership, for you to do whatever you want with it, then you would never be accountable for it. But the very fact that you and I will be accountable on Yawm Al-Qiyamah means that nothing you have is there except that it all belongs to Allah and He gives it to you with secondary ownership. So as a human being, we can never truly call anything our own. And that is where we find the deep relationship between Deen or Deeni Dayana, Recompense, or Yawm Al-Deen, the day of recompense, and Malik, the owner of that. When Allah gave you something, He was the primary owner, Al-Malik. And He gave that to you to do what He wants you to do with it. Which is why He will take you to account for it. Every single thing you could ever imagine. And we'll get into further detail. So we already mentioned, you know, the physical aspect, you know, be it your bodies or the material things around you. Yes, Allah, He gave it to you. We have to use it in His cause. But one of the meanings of the name Al-Malik is the master. And what is a master? Somebody who has mastery over something. And this can mean many things. This can mean many things. Take for example, your mastery when it comes to your work. Your expertise that you have in your field of work or field of study. Some of you may be doctors, some of you may be engineers, some of us may be plumbers, electricians, butchers, etc, etc, shop owners. Who gave you that expertise and that mastery? None other than Allah. Allah gave you that mastery. Maliki yawmid deen. And he's going to take you to account for it. Meaning when Allah gives you something, some form of expertise, some form of mastery, it is with purpose. Why did Allah make you work in that specific field of work that you do? Was it just for you to enjoy? For you to think that you are the, your own owners, you can do as you want, work as you want, do whatever you want, and you will never be taken to account? Did mankind think that they were created aimlessly? And that they will not be returned to their Lord? Allah says, This is in Surah Mu'minun. So lofty is he, the true king, the true owner of everything that he gave you. And so every single time we're standing in salah and we're reciting Maliki Yawmiddin, we're reminding ourselves, everything about me, Everything that I have, everything that I am, everything about my identity will all be returning to Allah. Your hopes in this life, your desires, what you want, everything about you, your feelings even, it will all return to Allah. 
wa ilallahi turja'ul umur every single affair will return to Allah maybe 20 years ago you cannot even remember anymore that time you got angry over something it, even that will return to Allah and he'll take us to account for that good news to the one who sought plenty of istighfar may Allah make us of them Allahu akbar and so yes, when it comes to mastery, when it comes to, even if it's something of just the worldly sense, when Allah gives it to you, it's actually for you to use it to please Him. It is for you to use it in His cause. You can go work in whatever field of study you want. You can go do whatever you want in this life. But know that every single thing that Allah gives you, it is with purpose. Because He's the owner of it, the primary owner of your knowledge, of your wealth. The beauty that he gives to some of us. He gave it to you to test you with it. To see whether you will follow his rules. Or whether you will go against the sharia. May Allah grant us all protection. Likewise also with your strength that you may have. With the, again we mentioned the knowledge that we have. It all belongs to Allah. And he has complete mastery over it. And likewise also when it comes to your character traits. Think about for example honesty or gentleness, or again, having good manners. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions in a hadith, and it's part of a longer hadith, I'm going to paraphrase very, very quickly, is when some of the sahaba, they asked him if our character, our akhlaq, is it something that we improve on, on our own, is it something that we develop over time, or is it something that Allah put in us? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah, He's the creator, Al Khalik. He created your khuluq, your character. And all of, from all of the characters, he gave each human their own character. That which makes you, you. Allah created that. Your general basic behavior and manners, Allah created that. But then you can improve it. You can improve your manners as you start learning the deen and you start putting into practice. People, they ask all the time, how can I improve in my manners? How, how can I start being gentle with my family? How can I stop always being bad-tempered? How can I start controlling my anger? It all comes down to application, practice. When it comes to good manners, the only thing that will help you attain it is by constant practice. And every single time you falter, and every single time you fail to have good manners and then you criticize yourself and then you try harder the next time up until it becomes easy for you. But all of those characteristics that Allah loves, take for example, Rahmah, mercy. We know that in order for us to attain the Rahmah of Allah, we need to show Rahmah to others. Irhamu ahl al-ard, yarhamkum man fis sama. Show Rahmah to those on earth, the one in the heavens will show Rahmah to you. But what happens when you know that who owns that Rahmah? Allah. He's Ar-Rahman. And this is how the name Al-Malik and Al-Malik connects to every single other name. He owns the quality of Rahmah and he has complete mastery over it, meaning he decides who to give it to, how to give it, when to give it, how much to give, how little to give, how intensely to give or how subtly to give. Because he has complete mastery over that quality. So yes, you know that you need to have Rahmah. You need to show Rahmah to your families. You need to show Rahmah to the Ummah also. But you cannot do so unless Al-Malik, the, the owner, gives that to you. So that you can then go and show it to other people. Likewise, Rifq, gentleness. It's mentioned, who is, whoever is gentle with others, Allah will be gentle with them. Allah loves gentleness in all things. In all things, Allah loves it when his slaves are gentle with one another, including themselves. But how can you attain that rifq? Unless Ar-Rafiq himself gives you that rifq, that quality. He has complete mastery over gentleness, meaning he decides who to give it to. The believer understands this. And so when he raises his hands, he's asking Allah, Oh Allah, place mercy in my heart. Oh Allah, place gentleness in my heart. Oh Allah, place honesty in my heart. You are the Malik, you are the King, you own all of these qualities, all of these characteristics. And I cannot have any of it, and I cannot please you with any of it, unless you give it to me. So Al-Malik, the Master, who has complete mastery over all characteristics, over all qualities, over all things that you may see yourself having mastery of. Likewise, you want to have mastery of the recitation of the Qur'an. 
You want to have mastery when it comes to tajweed, but you will not attain it unless Al Malik, the master, gives you that mastery. You want to be able to have that or achieve that sense of mastery when it comes to when it comes to khushu, so that you know that it's a constant, consistent thing. But then you know Al Malik is the only one who can give it to you. This name of Allah, Al Malik, and Al Malik, it is so big that it should be in all of our du'as. You want to have a good family. You want to have good character. Ya Malik, Ya Malik, grant that to me. You own it, you control it. And I cannot show it to anybody unless you allow me to do so. Everything only happens bi'ithnillah, with the permission of Allah. And so that is how huge this name is. And that is how this name affects other names. Take for example the quality of lutuf, of subtleness, quite similar to gentleness. Allah is Al-Latif. He is the one who is gentle and very subtle with his slaves. And he loves it when his slaves are also the same. Are very caring and concerning, compassionate with one another. Take the quality of Ra'fa. Ra'fa is extreme compassion or pity. Allah is ar rauf the owner of that quality. Take the, the, the other example of Mawadda. We need to have love amongst one another. We need to have unity and love amongst the entire Ummah. The only one who can give that quality is Al-Wadud himself, the owner of Mawadda. And Al-Malik, the master of these qualities, determines who to give it to and how much to give and when to give and where to give. So again, you know, we should be turning to Allah with these names every single day, asking Him for all of these good qualities. Or to put it simply, the most comprehensive way to ask Allah for good character is we'll find in the sunnah, Allahumma inni as'aluka husnul khuluq. Oh Allah, I ask you for good character. Now that's actually part of a longer dua. But that's one, just one of the ways you can actually ask Allah. Again, may Allah grant us all a good understanding. And it has been quite a while. So we'll keep it over there for today. And we'll continue next week. Next week we'll start going over the Quran and what Allah says regarding His name in the Quran and some of the ayat regarding it. And also the different forms of hadith or types of hadith we'll find in the sunnah regarding this name. And there's some powerful hadith in regards to the names Al-Malik and Al-Malik. But just to end it again, we place an extra emphasis on Surah Fatiha in your salah. As we know that every single time we recite Surah Fatiha, we have to be thinking about the response of Allah. And perhaps now after studying the name Al-Malik and Al-Malik, you understand why when you say Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah He says Majjadani Abdi. And in another narration, my slave has submitted to me, or my slave has glorified me, or my slave has submitted all of his affairs to me. I think now we can understand what, what does it mean by submitting all of your affairs to Allah? Is that you know you're returning to Allah. You know that everything Allah gives you, all of your affairs, including your ibadah, Allah is the one who writes for you what, which ibadah you will do. Allah, He is the master, He is the owner of all of that, and He enables you to do so. And you know that you will return to Him. Yawmid deen, deen, recompense, accountability. And that's why we are always, when we recite this ayah, we feel humbled before Allah. And at that moment when your heart is feeling humble that you will return to Allah, you will stand before Allah, that is when you say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And you remember what Allah says. And when you say this ayah, when you recite this ayah, Allah he says, this is between me and my slave, and whatever my slave asks for, I'm going to give it to him. And then with your heart's desire, you say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ يَا رَبْ Guide me to the straight path. The path of those who you are pleased with, not the path of those who made him angry. Again, may Allah grant us all genital for those. May Allah perfect our salah for us. And the study of Asma al-Husna should perfect, first and foremost, our salah. It should help us with khushur and ihsan. We'll keep it over there. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم اجعل خير أعمالنا آخرة وخير أعمالنا خواتمة واجعل خير أيامنا يوم نلقاك اللهم إنا نسألك الثبات في الأمر والعزيمة على الرشد ونسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك 
ونسألك شكر نعمتك وحسن عبادتك ونسألك قلبا سليما ولسانا صادقا ونسألك من خير ما تعلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما تعلم ونستغفرك لما تعلم إنك أنت علام الخيوب اللهم ارزقنا حبك وحب ما ينفعنا حبه عندك اللهم ما رزقتنا مما نحب فاجعله قوة لنا فيما تحب اللهم وما زويت عنا مما نحب فاجعله فراغا لنا فيما تحب وصلى الله على نبينا محمد أقول قولي هذا تبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك